Kelly Linville, also known as Bellingham's Mayor Kelly, recently announced her plans to retire at the end of 2019. Mayor Kelly joins us today for Bellingham Voices. Thanks for being here, Mayor. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. So we're going to talk about your retirement in a little bit, but first let's start with saying that you're a fourth generation Whatcom County native. What was it like growing up in Bellingham? I wish I'd brought a picture with me that I have that I found in an old, old album of my parents. I'm three years old. Uh -huh. I'm standing in a grassy field uh, right across from Fairhaven Middle School um, with a handmade real estate sign that says for sale. And it was the lot my parents bought in 1950 and built their little small house on the GI Bill. And there was nothing. We were the second house on that, Hoth that part of Hawthorne Drive. And there was nothing else. It was a field. And we went from 35,000 people when I was growing up to almost 90,000 people now. So the community has grown quite a bit. And I think in um, growth has impacts, but I think in general, uh, the growth in our community has been managed well. What is the biggest change over the years that you've, you've noticed about our community? Well, um, when Bellis Fair Mall was, was developed, uh, you went from being able just to walk in downtown Bellingham, down Cornwall, down Holly, and of course there were only 35,000 people, and you rec could recognize almost everybody. Mm -hmm. um, there was just one downtown core. After the mall was built and the population started spreading out from the central neighborhoods, um, what my husband and I noticed, we're both fourth generation, is we go to a restaurant, we go to a movie, we go to uh, the mall, we go places, and we don't recognize anybody. And it's because so many new people have either been born here and raised here or come here, and we both understand why, because we think this is the best place in the world to live. Why? For me, it's partially the size. Um, we're big enough to have uh, resources, but we're small enough to still work together. Mm. Um, there's probably more community values that are the same. I don't, I, even though we have a, we have a, you know, we have different interests, you know, all along the continuum. I think people still like um, the environment that we have here, the weather, the size of the community, um, the it, the recreation, the things, the places to live. And our community surveys are just very consistent. 90% think Bellingham is a great place to live. And what are the challenges? Homelessness, mm. affordable housing, and either jobs or safety. So um, it, it's pretty consistent. Even with the, our challenges, people still think this is a great place to live. Well, because it is. Let's because just, it is. Let's just say it. That, that's a fact. Um, when you're not working, say, those few hours every <laughs> week, what do you love to do? Well, one of the things that I, I love to do is read, and I promised myself I would not have more than two books by my bed, because <laughs> I usually have a chance to read at night, um, and I have almost 20 now again, so <laughs> I'm not getting much of my reading done now, but I plan on <laughs> getting it done. Um, I spend a lot of time kind of junking and going to estate sales and garage sales and thrift stores, because for the last 15 years, I've had a space a consignment space down at um, Penny Lane, which is an antique mall in town. And it's kind of my stress reliever. So instead of being out and just, I, I told my husband, it's not shopping for no reason, it's shopping for a reason. Right, right, <laughs> it's justified. <laughs> and that's something I like to do. And then the favorite thing I like to do is spend time with my family, because most of my immediate family is here. And, and you have uh, a couple of grandchildren. Three, right? three yeah. now. Nice. Two, one is actually in Berlin right now. She's taking a, her junior year abroad. And my other is a junior, will be a junior at Squalicum High School. And then I have a 15-month-old grandson who lives in Southern California. So I'm obviously looking forward to seeing him more often. Wow. Do you have a Bellingham secret you'd like to share? <laughs> well, I don't have secrets, so it's really hard <laughs> to think of a special secret. Um, I think if I think the one thing about Bellingham to me that is special is that you can be um, alone in this town if you want to be, 
And it's not really a secret because I think other people know that. But there's many places around town where you can go, where you become, and this is probably for me, more invisible. Um, because I'm used to people recognizing me or me recognizing other people. Yeah. And I still find places I can go that are quiet and that are peaceful. And, uh, and I guess where if you were to admit those to us today, they wouldn't be quiet they're not, no, no secrets, no, they wouldn't be secrets. So, so I, I think it's just that everybody can find that quiet time here yeah. and can be as active and as busy and as um, excited as they want also. But I like the quiet places. Yeah. Uh, so what, as, as the mayor of Bellingham, what does an average day look like? to you? Well, I had an employee ask me the other day if the mayor was a full-time job, <laughs> which I thought was really interesting considering wow. that the city of Bellingham has chosen to have a strong mayor and a weak council. And when I say weak, I don't mean it in, a, in a derogatory way. It's just that instead of having a city manager, they really have a, a mayor that manages the city mm -hmm. and represents the city. So what I said to, to this person was, well, I don't work an eight to five job, uh, but I'm on 24 uh, seven because you never know when someone's gonna need you. You, you do things in the evening, you do things on the weekend. <clears throat> um, I have a fairly flexible schedule, but I probably spend at least most of the day in my office or meeting with people or out at appointments mm -hmm. in addition to all the extra things we do. Mm -hmm. So I would say that um, I have an executive team check-in every morning to just kind of touch base. We have a board. It's usually full. We try to make it all the way through the list before we leave. Um, I participate and share department head meetings, agenda bill meetings, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, I I'm involved at the policy level for a lot of our department heads. So we have city center meetings. We have, as you can imagine, homeless meetings and yeah. housing meetings and waterfront meetings. And we, we've created teams that work together. So every day there's a different team. I meet with constituents. So uh, I appoint probably 200 people to boards and commissions, people that are willing to give of their time and volunteer to make the city a better place. And I like to meet with them the first time that they are appointed because um, I like to tell them personally thank you and shake their hand for what they're doing. And I like to talk to them about what their expectations and my expectations are for participating in city government. So that's important. I meet with uh, the president of the city council every week. Um, and I meet with the council members once a month or more often if they want me to. And of course, I attend all the council meetings and, and all of that. And then I have um, probably every night I could go to an event. Uh, so either I go for a short time and at this point in my career, um, or I make a donation, or I participate in another way. Uh, but you can fill up your whole, your whole day and evening and weekend because um, Bellingham is a participatory town mm. and they like to see their mayor too. So I try to do as much as I can outside of sitting in my office and doing the work I have to do. Right. Sounds like a full-time job to me. It is a full-time job. Yeah. 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 So you have over 40 years of public service and you started in the Bellingham Public Schools, is that right? Mm -hmm. give, I, us a, give us a timeline of that. Okay. Well, I started in the public, Bellingham Public Schools as a half-time uh, speech pathologist, audiologist. Um, I think it was 1976. And I ran for office the first time in uh, 1990. I lost that election. I worked, went back and worked for the school district for a couple years. Then I ran for election again and won in 92. And that was the year of the woman. And so that's the year that we elected Patty Murray as our state senator and all, almost all of our elected officials at the state at the state level were women mm -hmm. and we had the highest percentage of women in the in any state legislature in the country now that's changed now there's a lot more women involved in politics right um, I lost an election in 94 I got reappointed in 95 when Pete Kremen became the county executive and then I served continuously until 2010 
what drew you to public service? I guess probably partially my mother. I always say I had a Republican businessman father mm -hmm. and a do-gooder mom. And my mom was involved in a lot of community activities. And I think she, both my parents were the ones that taught me um, that community service and volunteering and um, caring, like my, in my father's case, caring a lot about his employees um, was an important thing to do, an important value to have. So I always participated in something in school and, you know, girl state and elected office and Blossom Time Queen and uh, a bunch of other Were stuff. You? Oh, yeah. Oh. Huh. Pretty impressive, huh? Yeah. I have my picture in a, in a convertible right in front of City Hall. Wave Elbow, elbow, wrist, elbow, 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 blow a kiss. Yeah. Yep, I did that. But I went on to do more. Oh, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But, um, and then I married my second husband, Will Roll, who had um, been on the county council for 12 years. And he, they had tr actually tried to recruit him to run for the Senate before they recruited me. And he told them to talk to his wife because she'd be much better at it than he would be. So he, he isn't allowed to complain about my, <laughs> my elected service because I always tell him it's his idea. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you might have had being a woman in, a, in, a, in an industry or in a profession dominated by men. Well, when I worked for the school district, it wasn't that way okay. until you got into positions of leadership, like I was the president of our education association. But we had other women that did that. I led a teacher strike. But we had, I don't think we had anyone else who had done that at that time, but people have since. Um, when I entered the legislature, the, the first thing that was very clear to me is when you were a man and you were first elected to the legislature, you had to prove that you couldn't do the job. So you came in with the expectation that you would be good at this. Prove that you couldn't. Prove that you couldn't. Okay. When you were a woman and you came into the legislature, you had to prove, prove that you could. You could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference I saw. Um, on the other hand, um, I was of the age, because I was 43 when I entered the legislature, I was of the age where it was kind of prior to um, the w real women's rights move movements and things like that. And so I never really ran on being a woman. I, I ran on being the, what I thought was the best candidate for the job, mm -hmm. which I think served me well in the long run because I don't always vote for the woman. Mm -hmm. I, I vote for who I think is the best person. Everything being equal, I always vote for the woman. <laughs> but, sure, yeah. but in general, I think that it's really your ability that should dictate um, if you if you're elected to office uh, rather than your gender or your ethnicity or anything like that. And of course, it's good to have um, uh, a lot of uh, different perspectives and everything in, in our governments and other places. So um, I'm happy that more women are running, more people of color are running, um, more uh, people with different uh, sexual orientations are running. All that is, I think, excellent. And it just says that we're becoming more integrated as a, as a society, even though it's not fast enough. And, and getting true representation. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. What are some of your proudest accomplishments? Well, when I was in the legislature, one of the things that I wanted to do was have government work better so that people could feel a part of it. Uh, it was very difficult to do at the state level because the institution is so ingrained with how they do things. So um, being encouraged to run as mayor of the city gave me the opportunity to do a lot of things that I couldn't do at the state level, even though my last two years, I ended up writing a $34 billion state budget because I was the Ways and Means Chair. So I had worked myself into a position where I could influence, but it's different when you're the mayor of a smaller city and that you can actually see results on the ground all the time. Mm -hmm. My first goal was to make sure that I repaired all the relationships that appeared to be a little bit damaged when I took office. Uh, worked with the county on a unified uh, plan to protect Lake Whatcom. Worked on unifying our emergency um, uh, management service, mm -hmm. um, our EMS, so our, our 
are uh, had are are now all under the county instead of having Bellingham and the county be separate. Um, working obviously with the port on putting together a waterfront plan, and that's probably the thing I'm most I'm most happy about is. It took a lot of people, it took a lot of time, it took a lot of public input, but I had started working on that project in 1995 as a legislator trying to get worker retraining for the plant closing for the employees, working on getting the money to clean up the pollution, uh, securing $25 million for the project that needed to be matched with local investment. So we are starting to collect our million dollars a year from the state. And then finally seeing something on the ground. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that was the most important thing to me, is to let the, the public know that for all we were doing, until they saw something different on the waterfront, yeah. you couldn't tell. And I'm, um, I would love for it to be quicker, um, but considering where we were in 1995, I'm thrilled with what's happened. Well, and considering what was there for so long, mm -hmm. I mean, I remember in the mid-90s when this was starting to be a thing, that GP was going to close and we were going to have this great park down there, <laughs> and I just had this feeling of, this is so overwhelming. Is this ever going to happen? And now look where we are, mm -hmm. so thank mm -hmm. you for that. You're welcome. And it's going to even just get better and better. It's and just going to get better and better. and. And I know there were people, you know, that had decided, well, this should be a, this will be a great, great big park. Yeah. We also needed to, to consider the people that used to work down there with family wage jobs and leave an opportunity for some of that to happen too, which I think we ended up doing. We compromised in the, in the final plan to make sure that we connected to downtown, that we had the open space that we'd promised, and that we had the opportunity for different um, cost of cost housing, and then for jobs. Yeah. And I, I think that we tried to to make that an extension of our community instead of something mm -hmm. separate onto itself. And it, the truth of the matter is, when even when the waterfronts redeveloped, it, uh, Old Town is going to be the center of downtown, which is why I'm so passionate about the fact that we have an agreement with Parberries now to move and that we're looking at implementing the Old Town Plan that was developed years ago, mm. and that we're still cooperating and working with the Lighthouse Mission to take care of people that need help. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the thing I like to see is pieces get integrated, you know, and come together, and then solve a problem that the residents of Bellingham can see make, made a difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give young people who want to get into public service? First of all, know your community. Mm. Um, I think an advantage I've had is that I was born and raised here. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody that's going to be ma mayor needs to be born and raised here. Mm -hmm. But it certainly helped me know the community and the values that I wanted to represent. Um, I would say get involved early and often. Uh, one of the, the best resume builders for someone that, that's running for office is to let the people that are voting for them see how they make decisions by being on a board or a commission. I was on the planning commission. I represented the teachers union. Um, I volunteered a lot. I think getting involved um, and kind of, I, I would say kind of earning, earning your stripes so by the time you want to run for a very important office like state legislator, or state senator, or mayor, or, or even council member, you have um, a track record. And when people see your track record, they're much more likely to be pre um, satisfied with your performance mm -hmm. because profiles don't always make the best elected official. But experience does. does yeah. mm -hmm. So you have recently announced that you're not don't have any plans to run for a third term, right? right. H hence your retirement from public service. Um, why? <laughs> why? Why stop now? Well, uh, first of all, um, it's been 41 years of service, which is a nice record. I, I'm, I'm pleased with the different things I've been able to do in public service. Secondly, I just turned 71, and I really want a lot of time to spend with my husband and my family without a blue card or a blue folder or a schedule because all three jobs I've had are pretty much my schedule's been controlled outside of what I'd like to do. Um, so I get a, I got a schedule when I worked for the school district that said 
you know, which schools and where I was going. I got a blue card in the legislature for 17 years that said, this is your day. And um, as a mayor, I get the blue folder because <laughs> I need more paper, I guess, um, that gives me my schedule every day and what I'm going to do. And um, I don't know if you know if I'll know how to schedule myself, but <laughs> I get to try, and I think I'm going to enjoy that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still healthy, and I'm still happy, and... Um, and I feel like I'm leaving the city in a good place for the next person who I am willing to help as much as they'd like me to. Speaking of that next person, what advice do you give to the next mayor of Bellingham? Well, most of the people that I've heard that are running now have some kind of experience in local government. So um, hopefully that means they know what they're getting into. Um, I did suggest to one candidate that they read the city charter to make sure that they knew what was intended, you know, what their job was intended to be. But on the other hand, I guess I'd just say be open-minded, know what your own principles are, so that when you get all the input that you're going to get from every interest group, neighborhood, friends, uh, people that are unhappy, people that are happy, not as many <laughs> of those, um, that, that you can figure out what the best thing to do for the public is. And, and if you can filter everything through and understand there's not one group or, or one interest that has the answer, they all have input that helps you make a good decision, then remember that your audience is the public. Your audience is not... Um, you know, union members, it's not just environmentalists, it's not just social service advocates, it's not just business people. It really, to make Bellingham a great place, is all of those people mm -hmm. working together. And um, it takes a lot of, and I guess the one, the one thing I believe is it takes a lot of um, self-assurance in your principles to be able to filter through all the noise. Mm. And, um, and it can be difficult. You usually disappoint your friends first. Um, but it's not about making your friends happy either. It's about really serving the public. Is that something that you've always been conscious of? Or is that something looking back that you realize? You know, I, I think in some ways I've always been conscious of it because my parents were so concerned about us, my th two sisters and I, not making it about ourselves. Mm. I mean, we grew up in a family where giving to other people and thinking about other people was very, very important. So I think I kind of grew up with that ethic. And then when I was, uh, especially uh, when I was led the t teacher strike, I made sure that I represented our local teachers and our local community instead of the state association that came in to try to help me. Uh, because I knew I would live in this community and they would go home. Mm -hmm. And when I was a legislator, the biggest lesson I learned is the first time I voted against my, against my conscience was the last time. When was that? Um, it, was in the, it was in one of the early years, and I knew that a vote would be politically good uh, for me, in fact, necessary, but not what I, what I truly felt in my heart. And I was supported by people who were interested in this vote to say, you can't do that because we need you in the legislature. So I voted the way that would um, help me not, help me potentially get reelected. Um, and, but I was never satisfied that I'd done the right thing. So for the next 15 years, yeah. I always voted my conscience first, my district second, and my caucus third. Mm. And that, that helped keep me centered. Well, I guess there's a, there's a, a balance there, right? Because you want to stay in the position where you are so you can affect more change, but that's a tough, tough place to be. Well, I think as long as you're not talking about your conscience votes, I think you can uh -huh. be more flexible on, on your district trying to put together something that works better or your caucus, following the caucus when it's not something that's real important to either you or your community right. but when you go against your principles you know for me I couldn't I couldn't live with it and I'm very happy I had 15 more years yeah. to make it up we are too <laughs> so it's January 2nd 2020 you wake up in the morning you have no blue folder on your desk yes. what is the first thing you do the first thing I do is I don't get dressed 
You don't get what? <laughs> dress. You don't get dressed. You stay in your pajamas. Okay. <laughs> That's the first thing. Uh -huh. I told my husband, who, who worries, you know, you've been so busy your whole life. I'm afraid, you know, you, all of a sudden you'll just collapse, you know, in a pile somewhere. I said, you don't have to worry about that. But in general, if I didn't have anything to do for a month, I could just, I could go do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. I could read those books that I haven't been able to read. I could talk to friends that I never have time for anymore. I could, you know, see my kids and my grandkids more than I do now. Um, I could go out to a movie with my husband. Um, just whatever and not have to plan ahead. Mm -hmm. I really do, for the last 40 years, worked on a schedule. Mm -hmm. And I just think that first day when I wake up, I'm not going to have a schedule. And it's going to feel great. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you so much oh, for well, everything you've done for our community over the years. Biggest honor I've ever had is representing the city in which I grew up. Wonderful. Thank you. Mayor Kelly, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Bellingham Voices, and we'll see you next time.